Computers today are really sophisticated, aren't they? It seems as if that every single day there's some incredible new capability that's being talked about in the news. For about 60 or 70 years, computers were built upon an architecture of one central processing unit, a CPU, doing tasks sequentially, one after another. And yet in the past couple of years, we've seen vast, new, powerful, parallel computational techniques. The ability to execute lots of instructions all at once. And it's these capabilities that enable amazing new graphical whiz-bang capabilities and very sophisticated AI, and also the ability to do complex parallel computations for things like blockchain. But these new forms of complex parallel computations enable other things as well, mapping complex systems well for the first time. I began to look at different models of how to simulate different complex natural interactions. For example, different gases diffusing into each other. And I began to have a very strange thought. There were complex mathematical instructions being executed in order to simulate this process. But what if there was the inverse? What if, in actual fact, whenever these kinds of physical processes happen, there is a computational process happening? And I sat with this thought for a long time, and I really boggled on it. And I decided to do some research. And I discovered that a few years ago, some scientists decided to take a bucket of water and agitate it using voices, like saying a word like zero or one. And by observing the input and the output, they could turn this into a form of neural network, basically a perceptron, pattern recognition in a bucket. Weird, huh? I mean, we think of computation as requiring silicon chips, and yet computation can happen in physical media as well. What a strange idea. And I began to look at this physical computing idea a little bit further, and I discovered some other research using things such as this hot ice, this sodium acetate. And as these crystals expand, in fact, they are doing computation, so they are finding the optimal way to split up into little cells, all of these different crystals. In a sense, this is like a geometric computer, but built from purely natural forms. There is a technique evolving at the moment called reservoir computing. And it means that you can turn physical, different physical properties of materials into complex computation. Here, these are little silver nanowires. And I'm sure whenever you were younger, your grandmother maybe told you not to put a silver spoon near an egg, right? Because it would form a black mass. And that's called silver sulfide. And in these silver wires, these little bits of silver sulfide can form. And in fact, it means that they turn into little synapses. So some of the connections are stronger than others. And by passing a small amount of electrical current through these, something very akin to natural human or animal neural networks begins to arise. Basically, it's like an abiotic or an abiological form of computation, a form of neural network that arises just from physical media. In the natural world, there are some hypotheses that creatures like spiders use their webs to create a kind of a natural computer, the same way that a market trader might use an abacus to help with doing computations. It's a sort of extended cognition, doing calculations using something in the environment. Take a look at this slime mold. It's a very simple creature. Looks a little bit like dog vomit to me. And yet, this simple and not terribly aesthetically pleasing creature 
is capable of some amazing computational feats. It's a single-celled organism, and we think of it as just a big blob. But if we look at it on a scale of time that is a little bit different from our own, we notice that it is, in fact, probing its environment and making decisions about whether to explore or to exploit. In essence, this little single-celled organism has agency. It's able to choose things that it prefers, one or the other. And in fact, you can do experiments where you can put a slime mold in between different multiple sources of food. And it turns out that they like protein. They prefer when they have about 30% protein in their food, and they will choose the food that they prefer. A single-celled organism is capable of agency. And they're also capable of it when they all come together. Biofilms can form when lots of different little single-celled organisms, like bacteria, get together. And they live in little cities, and they exchange resources with each other, because the ones on the outside, they take the brunt of damage, but they protect the ones on the inside. And there's a kind of an exchange, so the ones on the outside get more of the resources because they're doing more of the work. And in fact, it turns out that bacteria can recruit others, even bacteria of other species. They kind of send like little wet messages to each other, you know, like YOLO or What's Up or Come and Join the Party. And they do this through electrical means. In a sense, it's electronic. In the membranes of cells, there are ion exchange channels. And these enable forms of electronic communication between bacteria. And they can also function a little bit like a neural network, in a sense. Weird, huh? What I find really weird is that cells like this make up all of our bodies, trillions of them. And all of these little cells are like little nanomachines. And so in many ways, we are the emergent construction of trillions of different nanomachines, all operating together. And that's an order of magnitude less than the number of microbes that we have in our bodies. And we can't live without those. Those are an essential part of our bodies doing their thing. Trillions and trillions of little cells all working together. And we think of our brains as being the epitome of intelligence. And they are very sophisticated, of course. But there's only 86 billion neurons or so in the average human brain. And yet there are trillions and trillions of cells. And perhaps there's hundreds or even thousands of times more computation within our cells operating together than in our brains, per se. And all of these cells have their own little agencies. They're all choosing and optimizing for different things. Even these neurons, this is a cultured neuron cell. And look, observe and behold as it explores its environment, and it's looking for the optimal connections with other neurons. In a sense, these little neurons are forming alliances with each other, and from those alliances we get the emergent property of consciousness. One definition of intelligence is the ability to triangulate information from multiple different viewpoints. And it seems as if these little tiny intelligences are searching for different potential options in the future, choosing the best one, reaching forward and bringing it back into the present. There's an aspect of biology called quantum biology, and it looks at how quantum processes influence how biological organisms function. Things like olfaction, smelling things, navigation, photosynthesis, all of these processes use quantum mechanical processes to operate. And bacteria do the same. Evidence suggests that bacteria use a machine learning technique known as a random walk. But they do it in a quantum fashion, a quantum random walk, which is orders of magnitude more sophisticated than our finest computational algorithms. 
And perhaps we can harness some of these capabilities that bacteria have, that we currently do not in our technology, to amplify and create new forms of artificial intelligence that we can scarcely imagine today. There are other methods by which the universe is optimized and decisions are made. Our entire universe is winding down a pattern called entropy. And eventually that's going to lead to the heat death of the universe as everything gradually gets colder and colder and little bits of gas and heat diffuse until there's one big empty negation of matter and energy. Basically everything just distributes until everything's so thin you can't do anything. And yet, life is something that can avoid this process through something called negative entropy. Basically, life itself is an orderly decay of energy states. And we all require new information and new energy in order to combust and survive. And life is a semi-stable organization, which means that we take in lots more energy, we combust it, and in so doing we avoid coming to an end of entropy ourselves, or at least we can offset it for a generation or so. Through this process, all life has evolved, and all life is trying to maximize its entropy, maximize the amount of energy that it can combust. And it seems as if there have been many different phase shifts throughout the history of the universe as this process of negative entropy has gotten more sophisticated. A hydrogen at atom might wander the universe and for billions of years hardly enter a star or enter a planet or do anything interesting in its complexity. And then it suddenly finds itself inside a simple organism like a bacteria. And the amount of complexity and the amount of energy that is passing through that process is vastly increased. And then it might move into plants and insects, more complex structures. And from there, from prokaryotic into eukaryotic cells, ever more sophisticated levels of complexity and negative entropy. And from there we get consciousness. And consciousness has enabled another level of energy combustion, thanks to human beings. Ever more complex forms of combustion. And the most complex we've discovered so far are computational abilities themselves. It seems as if our universe has gone through many different stages in its history. The age of radiation, and then cooling into matter. And thanks to the properties of entropy in the universe, life beginning to form. And in particularly complex forms of life, there began to emerge consciousness. And consciousness like you and me created a new form of life called technology. And technology is now enabling vastly new layers of complex computation and negative entropy that have never been seen before. To me, this is perhaps how we begin to unite the spiritual with the scientific, the numerical with the numinous. I cannot help but behold in awe and joy the majesty of our computational universe. And I invite you to celebrate this with me. Thank you.